I think the first thing is that the Isle had traded for almost a, well, almost a century before Gardner ever arrives on it in terms of its otherness to England. If you think you had to get there before, before air travel by boat, there's the element of having a cruise, there's the Gulf Stream, there's palms, there's a sense of difference, a Gaelic-speaking population. A Gaelic-speaking population who would not, it should be noted, and you, as you all probably know, let the crofts fall into ruin so that the, themselves could inhabit there, but they'd been driven from the land by landlordism and famine and greater, greater opportunities in America or Canada. So you can see the way that Pathé are beginning to put a gloss on things, you know? It's not all funny, it's not all larks, but you've got the sense of the fairy folk, otherness, and at the end, you've got the witch, Gerald Gardner. I think that should get most of you thinking already. You've got a man who's a witch. We don't normally gender witches that way, do we? Well, at the beginning of Wicca, they kind of did which I'm going to talk to you a little bit more later. So Gardner is interesting to begin with because he is assuming what is normally taken to be a feminized role. He's got, you know, no problem with it. He did that wholeheartedly. The other thing he's doing, and this is the only surviving little bit of film we've got of Gerald performing a ritual, is that, yes, he's performing a ritual. He's performing a ritual that was recorded on the aisle by John Clegg, at the start of the 20th century, um, but there are two accounts of it that probably kind of come from the middle of the 19th century. But Gerald isn't really doing what was recorded. He's changing it subtly, he's reworking it. In what was set down by Clegg, it was to be done with not a besom, not a witch's broom, but by a goose wing, you know? Goose wings, for those of you who may not know, they, would, they were used as dusters. They're really good for dusting an early modern uh, and an agricultural house. You know, you don't leave anything of the animal, uh, you know, out of the pot or, or underutilized. So the wing was a good duster. You know, it was, a, it was something that you would have found in Manx crofts in the, across the 19th century. But more significantly than that, and you can kind of see why he'd use a broom rather than a wing, you know, where was he gonna get a goose's wing in 1959 at the drop of a hat? More significantly than that, in the original account, it's not as Pathé and Gerald talk about sweeping away the bad luck at the crossroads and bringing good luck in. It's about a whole business of overlooking Somebody has been ill-wished by a witch, by a neighbor, by a cunning man or a cunning woman. So the whole thing with Gardner is turned on its head. Witchcraft is not the thing that you need counter magic, good magic to fix. Witchcraft is the good thing at the very, very beginning. Witches are not frightening. We're not in the Wizard of Oz with flying houses and, you know, green figures who get, who get pulped and, you know, shouldn't go anywhere near a rainstorm. We're in a very different territory with his concept of witchcraft. And what I'm going to try and suggest to you over the next 45 minutes or so is that this is Gardner's actually great contribution, his great ability to take things that have been bubbling under and use them just like the Manx ritual you saw there been bubbling around in popular culture, in popular belief, in art and literature for up to a century through the Romantic movement and to give them life, to make them live again, to come to their full. This is what he's all about. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. The other thing to say about Gardner at the beginning is that he's a figure who's attracted an awful lot of, well, he's been misrepresented for all kinds of reasons. And we can maybe talk about that in the Q&A and why that happened at the beginning. But the most um, common academic trope, you'll find it, you pick up any academic article, anything an undergrad's written, 
anything somebody's done and a little pricey about modern witchcraft, and you get the same thing over and over and over again. Gerald Gardner, a retired uh, colonial civil servant. I even used it when I started lecturing, to be honest. Uh, so I'm as guilty as everybody else. But if you begin to unpick that, you get a very different picture. Those ideas, the imperial civil servant, I think gives you a lot of ideas about the British Empire, colonial attitudes, all those kinds of things. Gardner wasn't a Colonel Kurtz figure. He didn't go up the river and suddenly have a revelation because he was never bought into the imperial system even to begin with. He is completely off the scale, I'd suggest to you, um, for people growing up in a wealthy background in the early 20th century. He has the most bizarre childhood you can think about. He's pulled from pillar to post by his alcoholic governess, who just goes, just goes off piste with him for months at a time. So she takes him to the Canary Islands. He was asthmatic. He was a puny child, younger son. So she takes him off. So they go, to, first of all, to the Canary Islands. They go to North Africa. And then they go to Malaya. And then she shacks up with a rubber planter, and Gerald follows. Now, Jack Bracelin, who was one described as Gerald's sort of man Friday, Gerald had a, had a little close group of male friends, and Bracelin was, was one of the main ones, really, with Angus MacLeod here on the aisle. And in fact, Bracelin and MacLeod were quite f similar in some ways. <laughs> Bracelin always reckoned, his, his pet theory, was actually Gerald was illegitimate and that the governess was his real mother. And people have abandoned, he said, no, no, it couldn't possibly be the case. But you look at his biography and you see him tied to this abusive woman's strings until his early middle age. He's wherever she is. One of the most painful bits in his autobiography, which was sold at the witch's mill and is a really good read by Bracelin. Bracelin ghost wrote it with Idris Shah, the great Sufi mystic and writer who lived up at Port Jack, that I'll come on to a bit later if I've got time, um, is this sense of the absolute brutality of how he was raised. He talks about being put into a railway carriage with Com, his, his governess, when they set out, and he asks her to read him something. He loved Ivanhoe, he loved Walter Scott, of which more later, and they're big, big formative influences with Gerald. And she says, read it yourself, and slaps him. And that's how it goes on. So from her, it has to be said, Gerald picked up his aversion to alcohol. He's a lifelong teetotaler, hates alcohol. He hates marijuana. He does, however, quite like opium. And he says lots of positive things about opium. And he was also a customs inspector of opium in the Far East. <laughs> now, there are theories about when he comes back to the Isle of Man, how does somebody who, and this is where I'm saying the civil servant trope doesn't work. You think about a civil servant in the 19th century, 20th century, an empire. You think of starch collars and military mustaches and, you know, sort of Baden-Powell figures. I know he wasn't a civil servant, but you know what I mean. Those kinds of attitudes to race, to gender, to empire, all those kinds of things. So Gardner rocks up in the Isle of Man with private wealth, and it's come from somewhere. It hasn't come from the civil service. It hasn't come from his family, a Liverpool merchant family. They made, they made their fortune in cord and rope for the Navy. So, and the other thing about this, why I think the idea, his, his early life is so bizarre, is he does none of the things that were expected of his class at the time. He doesn't go to school. The thing we were saying about his nurse slaps him and says, read it yourself. He can't read. His, and it can be overstated, this thing. He, the other trope about Gardner is that he basically couldn't write and everything's ungrammatical. I've seen what he wrote. <laughs> yeah, he, he was slipshod with grammar. One of the big problems about working out what he's trying to say, particularly in his rituals, particularly when he's writing anything for sense, is he never put full stops in or commas. 
and he's trying to reconstruct the sentence, but it can be over, his illiteracy can be overstated. What is more important is that he's an autodidact. Let's go back to that thing again about him being the, the civil servant. He only works for the civil service for a very short period of time. For most of his working career, he's a tea or rubber planter, and planter culture was really different. It was rugged, it was male, it was adventuresome. But even then, Gardner transcends it. He doesn't opt out of Judeo-Christianity because he's never had it, as far as I'm concerned. So he uses his holidays. He goes to Jalor on a, um, an archaeological expedition. He's passionate about archaeology. He's self-taught with everything he does. He goes to Malaya and spends time with the tribal people there. And what does he do? He takes opium with them. He sees seances, he experiences magic. He's with uh, the Dayaks in Sarawak. He has run-ins with headhunters and pygmy tribes. And this isn't fiction, this is what he was doing. So he's out there on his own trajectory. And I think the important thing about him is that if we think about magic or witchcraft, the telescope has almost been the wrong way round since Gerald died. There's this idea, the other trope about him is, he's, a, you know, he's an old man who makes it all up. Well, he's creative. He certainly does make some things up, particularly on the Isle of Man, but we'll come on to that a little bit later. But he doesn't make it all up. And people have fixated and academics have fixated on this idea that you look at him only through the Western tradition of high magic, the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn, Alistair Crowley, all that kind of stuff, the great ceremonial magicians. Gardner is not there. He's not there for lots of reasons. And I'd suggest it, although he does read and imbibe that stuff, that's true. But his primary, I think, stimulus is that he has experienced tribal religion as a living thing. And this, by the time he's on man, he's equating to witchcraft. So what does he see the pagan people of Malaya doing? He sees them scrying. He sees them looking into lights or flames for, for large periods of time. He sees them with a form of animism. He sees them dancing till they get into ecstatic states. He sees the fact they, they don't wear many clothes, they very often perform rituals sky clad or nude, uh, and they believe in reincarnation. Lo and behold, when Gerald starts synthesizing Wicca on the Isle of Man, what does he put in there? Music, dance, communality, techniques like scrying, looking into darkened mirrors like John Dee and Kelly did, or into flames. One of Gerald's earliest photo shoots on the aisle is with a young um, Irish waitress, May Daly, who he sort of pays to be a witch for the day. And he has these photos taken of her staring into the flames. So scrying, nudity, you work your magic in the nude with Gerald, and you do it in a magic circle, and you have incense. Now, just that idea of incense, you think about the world in 1959. It's what, another reason I thought we'd have the film at the start. Those of you who may have been watching closely would have noticed a few things about Gerald. For a start, are the tattoos all the way up his arm, the tribal tattoos. He's got a couple of sailor ones, but mainly the Malay tribal tattoos. He's got what today we think of as full, full arm pieces going on. Okay, um, colonial civil servant, well, he's there in his sort of beatnik, you know, red sweater in his corduroys and his sandals. He's got a ritual dagger at his waist and he's wearing a silver bangle. Now, if you think about those things within the context of austerity Britain the first time round in the 1950s, I think they're all kind of striking. When you add to that, that he's drawing around him on the aisle, a lot of other people who, I think the, you can describe them as sort of hippies before there were hippies, you know, sort of beatniks, you know, but they're slightly older. So this group, he's got Bracelin, who he met down in St. Albans. Bracelin runs uh, his outfit and a coven down there. On the aisle, he's got people like Paul Le Canoe. 
He's got dear old Angus MacLeod. He's got um, and a wellspring of, of other people around him um, that he gets together over the last, well, 13 years of his life. And this is the crucial period, and this is why the Isle of Man is so important for the story of Wicker, I think, and what it became as a sort of worldwide phenomenon. And you only have to think of, I know it's getting a bit old now, but I think most of you, or some of you anyway, will remember things like Charmed, the series, you know, about the three witch sisters. Does anybody remember that? Yeah? Okay, good. There's enthusiasm at the front for it. But if you think about that, what do they have? They have a book of shadows, don't they? Spell book, right? Who created the book of shadows? Gerald Gardner, right? Um, as well as elevating the witch figure. So out of all that, Gardner is the main fount for all of that cultural development for various reasons I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, if he'd have died before he came to the Isle of Man, I certainly wouldn't be talking to you about him tonight. He'd be remembered as somebody who was quite interesting, he was in the Far East, somebody who had written two fairly shonky novels, to be perfectly honest. I mean, High Magic's Aid is his first foray, well, he does a, he does a sort of sub Dion Fortune reincarnation one about Crete that, anyway. Um, but it is really, I mean, if you've ever tried to read it, it's like, there is Wiccan dedication for it. It's like, and another thing, and another thing. But High Magic's Aid was written earlier before he came to the Isle, and he did that when witchcraft was still illegal. You still have the Freudian Mediums Act okay, isn't repealed until the Great Labour Government in 1951, of which more anon. So he's restricted in what he can write. So he writes this sort of sword and sorcery and chivalry sub Ivanhoe novel. And he bleeds in witch rituals that he's been doing with his little group, with his mistress, Edith, in the New Forest, that he's been doing with Jack Bracelin, uh, and Ray Bone and all the others, and Doreen Valiente over at St. Albans at Brickett Wood. And he wants these little rituals to live and work. So he'd done two pretty iffy novels. I mean, I wouldn't advise them as bedtime reading. And he wrote a pretty fair book about Malay ritual daggers. And that's another of his interests. He loves weapons. And the Malay dagger is great for him because A, it's weapon, boy stuff, and he collects them. So his, his house in Castletown, he had all the best stuff there and specially made drawers, you know, that he'd, he'd, he'd show people. And, but the idea of the Malays was, you know, like the blacksmith, I guess, in, within the British Isles and the Irish archipelago. Um, the blacksmith is somehow magical, the person who works the metal. And the Malays had this idea, you bled a spirit into it, so it became a magical blade. And for Gerald, this was great. And he collects these things and he writes a monograph that I think is pretty good. My dear old friend, Ronald Hutton, has very different ideas about its worth. He reckons it's garbage, but I think, I think it's okay. I like it, I'm more into the daggers anyway. So if Gerald hadn't rocked up here, he wouldn't have been remembered. Why is he remembered when he gets here? Well, he comes as the resident witch. He didn't found the museum, with, you know, the mill complex just outside Castletown by the, by the high school. That wasn't his baby. Uh, Red Gap, as it was then known, as some of you probably know, had been derelict uh, in the post-war period and had been derelict when farming, when agriculture fails around it. From, from the 30s. It was in a terrible state of repair. And Cecil Williamson, who was a great impresario, really interested in magic, comes along just after the war. He's a filmmaker. He'd been in army intelligence during the war. He'd had quite an exciting life, a bit like Gardner. He'd been out in modern days Zimbabwe, earlier to that as a tea planter. So you can see how him and Gerald started to gel. Um, and he's looking for somewhere, as he put it, to put on a show 
and he wants a witchcraft and folklore museum and he finds it with his wife Gwen at Castletown. They run it for three seasons from 51 to 53 and the business doesn't really work out for him. Um, the seasons are short. He and Gardner both have perennial rounds with the Castletown commissioners about getting a liquor license. If you look at any of their letters, any of the things that appear in the paper, it's these blinking so-and-sos, they won't give us a liquor license and we can't do anything. So that was one of the grinds. Williamson, though, has a very different idea. It is all about putting on the show. He has an idea originally that they're going to create an open, um, like an amphitheatre, like a turf theatre, and they're going to actually have rituals, magic, witchcraft, and it's all going to be shown and it's going to be wonderful. But he's got a great big problem. There are no witches. He looks for them and there are no witches on the Isle of Man. Right? Take it from me, particularly in Canada and North America, there is a whole train of garbage that says, Manx traditional witchcraft, this existed and the witches were all in the hills and whatever, and Gardner kind of came along and co-opted them. They didn't exist, right? You had cunning folk, you had charmers, you had all of that, you had belief in the fae and themselves, you did not have witches, apart from witch trials, of which more in a little bit. So Williamson tries to find particularly female witches, as you would think, wouldn't you, for his shows, and he can't find them. But he has a friend he's met in Atlantis Bookshop, which still exists in London. It's one of uh, Alistair Crowley's hangouts. And Williamson had met Gardner there, and the two hit it off. They're both creative, they're both really bright, they're both charismatic, and they're both interested in magic. So that it starts as a great friendship, and then it becomes a train wreck. Williamson brings Gardner over because he needs a show, he needs a ritual, he needs something for the press. Because if you're opening a witchcraft museum, the, the artifacts of witchcraft mainly, let's face it, do not survive for whatever may have been done in terms of rituals, because it was fairly low magic stuff, you know? A wand is a twig, isn't it? Yeah? Bless you, Sooty. But anyway. Um, so the, the kind of exhibits that Williamson had were not, weren't sexy, okay? There wasn't anything, and this is again something you find in the correspondence with a lot of the news agencies. They want something that, you know, evokes witchcraft. Where's the witch? Where's the, where's the ceremony? Where's the thing being done? Where's the cursing? Where's the magic? Where's the spells? It's not very exciting if it's all behind a glass case. So Williamson hits on this idea, we're going to have an opening ritual, and he brings Gardner as a self-identifying witch to go and do it. Gardner becomes his kind of expert, his go-to person, who knows stuff, who gets things lent from the Southern Coven, his little group, who were pretty defunct then, but around the New Forest, so he brings some stuff in from them through Edith. Um, and he supplies enthusiasm and advice and technical know-how. So he's very keen to have this little, the first of the things that I think endures, and anyone who probably went to the Witches Museum when it was a going concern will remember, he had the Witches Cottage exhibit, which was this idea that you were stepping into the hearth and home of a witch, that, you know, they'd suddenly gone out, but all the artifacts were there. So the chest in the middle of the, the scribed magical circle with, what Gerald saw as the witch's tools, the scourge, the necklace, the dagger, the chalice, all sitting there waiting to be enacted. So it looked like a little 17th century cottage, you know, hung with herbs, all this kind of stuff. That's number one that he does. Williamson brings in a great artist called Steffi Grant, who'd been associated with Crowley and High Magic, to do The Magician's Room, which is some, a lot of it survives in Boscastle, 
the, the amazing Museum of Witchcraft that's still there. And Simon Costin, the director, is amazing. And he's put lots of stuff back together from both Williamson's Museum and from Gerald's with a, with a real passion. So you can go and see these things today. So they, the altar was brightly painted. Everything is Kabbalistic. So you've got the rosy cross, you've got Rosicrucian stuff, you've got stuff out of Crowley. It's like an explosion in a sort of psychedelic paint factory everywhere you look. So it's, it's, very, it's very glitzy. Um, and that is what is there. Williamson finds pretty quickly that he can't make a commercial go of it. The season he thinks is too short. The only thing to make money is the witch's kitchen run by his wife, Gwen. Uh, and that does okay, selling, you know, tourist, tourist food really at the time. That does okay. And what you find is originally it was going to be the, the centre for uh, witchcraft and folklore. That doesn't last, that doesn't fly. What you find in all the Manx press, what you find in all the advertising is the witch's kitchen. And you can see the way that by the second season, Williamson was, was altering the brand a bit. Um, the other thing was, um, he, Williamson likes torture. I mean, you know, I don't mean it. I don't mean it in that way. But he's fascinated in torture objects. So a lot of the stuff is about witch trials. It's thumb screws, things to pop your eyes out. You know, really horrible things. And then he does trying to link to tribal religion, an exhibition of photos and artifacts to do with the Mau Mau rebellion in Kenya, and it's too close. Witchcraft is one thing. He's already having trouble from the bishop. You know, Bishop's Court up there. Suddenly, people who've done their national service in Kenya who've been involved in the emergency or the uprising or the revolution don't want to be reminded of it on their holidays. So that goes down like a lead balloon on him. More significantly, his relationship with Gardner completely goes out the window, utterly. They can only communicate by 53 through solicitor's letters. And I'd suggest... Some of it is jockeying, you know, you've got two alphas and which one is going to come out on top. It's complicated because the business goes down and Gardner dips into his pocket and buys the, the whole complex. So he's Williamson's landlord. And when the two fall out, you can see how that becomes really problematic. Um, but I think the rub of it between the two in essence, is that they had two very different ideas of witchcraft. Williamson is the ceremonial, the idea of witchcraft being dark, you have curses, you have a sort of magus figure, a man at the center of it, all this kind of stuff, uh, the rosy cross. Gardner is low magic, the cottage, the wise woman, the herbs hanging up, the spirit and voice of the people, the folk. And his witches don't curse, they don't take money for their art, they don't do bad stuff, they help. It's a fertility religion. The crops grow, yeah? Your baby's sick, you go to the village wise woman. And it's a feminized religion. And this is the kind of weird, and I still haven't, you know, eventually I'll make my mind up over it. The, the enigma that is Gardner is that there is this guy who uses his privilege, to use the fashionable term, to elevate women. Gardner's, if you go back to the 50s and you look at what's going out in terms of magical books, discussions about witchcraft, all that kind of stuff, all the Dennis Wheatley, all the Montague Summers, all the Aleister Crowley stuff, there is always a man at the center of it. It's the magician, the Faustus type. On the Isle of Man, there was the polar opposite of Gardner, Alexander Cannon. Okay, the magician's a man. And Cannon owns, have any of you come across Cannon? Some nodding. Cannon is as unlike Gardner as day is night. Cannon is viscerally right wing. You know, he's got the police are watching him out at Jerby because they're pretty sure he's a Nazi agent during the war. He has a very hierarchical view of ritual magic and it's all about the guy. The two women who live with him are, you know, the handmaidens and whatever. Gardner, despite all the baggage of the times, puts woman front and center. 
He never sets himself up, and this is why I like the guy, he never sets himself up as a guru. It's not some weird cult, although he uses the term witch cult for, for the early bit. He doesn't call it Wicca in the early days, but for Margaret Murray and her book on the subject, which we can do on Q&A if you want, he takes, his, he takes a lot of her, her ideas on board about the fertility religion, but he puts the priestess at the center. You've got a moon-worshipping, feminized, and by the late 1970s, feminist religion that Gerald Gardner gives birth to. And I think in a nutshell, you've got why I think he's culturally important. So that's where Gerald's going to. He writes his two books, Witchcraft Today and The Meaning of Witchcraft, on the aisle, okay? And this is against the backdrop from him taking full ownership of the museum for the 54 season. What does Gardner do? Williamson has absolutely trashed the place in a fit of peak when he leaves. So he smashes the lavatory bowls, he even as his wife picking off the little witch um, uh, transfers on the cups in the witch's kitchen. Um, so he takes more or less everything with him, okay? which is great because it all survives in Boscastle. That's the, that's the good bit of the story because he goes to Borton on the Water and then Boscastle and sets up his own rival museum. But Gerald comes in and he hasn't got enough stuff on the first season. So other than what the, you know, uh, the Southern Coven had lent him and his own collection of knickknacks, of which more in a sec. So what he does is, very practically, he fills it with his collection of armour. So if you look at a lot of the pictures or the wonderful postcards he produced, everywhere has got swords or suits of armor or gisales hanging from the blinking wall because Gardner, the overgrown schoolboy, the kid who's read Ivanhoe and, and Henty's novels of boyish daring do, this is what he likes, this is what he buys, this is what he fills his st stuff up. So he uses his own collections and his own collections are precisely that. There's no internet. This is Gardner scavenging junk shops. This is what he loves to do. And there's a brilliant little piece in Patricia Crowther's wonderful memoir of the early years of Wicca. Patricia's still alive. She's in Sheffield. I was just saying to the folks at Culture Venin, I've, me and a friend of mine are going to buy her a, a Hope this doesn't go out in advance, but next month it's a 96th birthday, so we're going to get a, ve a vegan birthday cake as a little surprise. But Patricia writes this beautiful account of Gardner going off round Douglas, uh, round all, and in Castletown, round all the junk shops, looking for bits of iron and scraps that he's going to make into ceremonial swords and bangles and all the ritual stuff. And the rituals that he's folding into witchcraft are his interests. You have a sword, yeah? You have your ritual jewelry, the bangle. Um, you have your scourge, because Gerald, with his abusive childhood, was also into a bit of S&M, but that's, that's, that's another story. But that's, you know, that's all part of it. So he goes off like this truffle hunting dog, looking for these knickknacks. So his collection isn't because you couldn't in those days, you know, pre-internet, you had to look at antiques fairs and shops, bookshops, you know? You couldn't just search up in the internet, Gerald Gardner, da, 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 meaning of witchcraft. You had to go and scour the place, and this is what he loves. And this means his collection goes from some stuff which is absolutely amazing and brilliant to a lot of crud. So when his collection was sold off about 20 years ago on the, on the nascent net. A lot of the stuff was sort of rubbishy charms. You know, a Manx cat in plastic, a Manx cat, you know, it looked like it fallen out, a Kellogg's bowl, you know, um, a badger's lucky paw. All it wasn't lucky for the badger, was it? Um, all this kind of stuff that he had to put together. So it's an incredibly idiosyncratic collection. But what he does is he redresses it. So going back to the, uh, you know, he's got his witch's cottage. He's happy with that. All the Steffi Grant stuff, Williamson had taken with him because it was his property. Gerald has to recreate it. And his idea is very, very different. He wants the high magic. Want, uh, let me get it right. 
Um, the left hand side, I think, was the, the low magic. The right hand side was the right as you went in, but I might be wrong, um, as you went up the steps onto the first floor. But his idea, even of high magic, because he's trying to show the different traditions, is less gaudy. It's again the magic circle. It's an altar that is really just a lectern for your spell book. At one point, and of course it's all surrounded with armor, isn't it? Uh, at one point he's got his wonderful little papier-mâché demon, George, that Arnold Crowther, Patricia's husband, made for him as a little present on the opening night of the ballroom. Um, so George always sat there, you know, for press op opportunities. And Gardner writes, one of the last thing he writes, his, his great nephews and nieces came over to the aisle for the holidays and Gerald delighted in making them up stories. And one of the, I think one of the best things Gerald ever wrote is this lovely little story called The Trouble with George about his household familiar spirit in Castletown who inhabits the house, okay? And George is a gremlin and he's fallen out with the seagulls on the prom at Castletown again and has headbutted one of them. And Gardner is writing this when his much beloved wife Donna, who's buried just outside Castletown, um, had, had passed on and things aren't great. But this is Gerald, I think, at his nicest. And he talks about ever, you know, in this little story, he says, ever since Donna's gone, I can't find anything. I always lose my wallet, my hearing aid's never there. I'm subsisting on jam butties, you know, and the gremlin steals everything. He's chewing through the wiring again in the house. And he, it's a beautiful, warm little story, The Trouble with George, that was published in an American magazine, New Dimensions, shortly before he died. Gardner's last work, again, that turns up in that American journal, was, I think, the forerunner for a full-scale book, and it was going to be on uh, Manx witchcraft and folklore. Uh, and it exists. I've got, uh, I've got a photocopied thing of what it, what it was going to be. And he, he takes up all the folklore, all the stuff from Waldron, you know, so you've got the Moxie Doo and Peel Castle, you've got bug ends coming out of your ears, you've got Waldron's story about, you know, the sleeping giant underneath the castle at Russian. You've got all of this stuff flung into the, into the mix. But then you've got Gerald's thing about the Manx witch trial of 1617 and Margaret Quain. Now, what does he do with that? What does he do with that in his museum? Well, to start off with, he chooses to make her emblematic of all the women who suffered during the European witch hunts of the early modern period. So he puts in, and there's a postcard of it, uh, Valerie Kane, who some of you might know, has got a copy of it. I've got a copy of it as well, but Val had the first one I ever saw. And it's a beautiful thing. It's, it's a little altar that he draped with, with black velvet. It had an offering bowl at the bottom and a picture of Margaret going to the flames, you know? And it had a, it had a little inscription to it, to the martyrs who died, the nine million women who'd perished in the European trials. You can take apart that figure today. You can be wise after the event. Nothing like nine million people perished during the European trials of the early modern period. But Gerald wasn't to know that. The only empirical research done about it was by an American feminist writer, an abolitionist, uh, trade union organizer called Matilda Jocelyn Gage, who was actually the mother-in-law of Frank L. Baum, who wrote The Wizard of Oz, for a curious coincidence. Um, but she wrote the first great feminist history of the witch, and she does as much work as she can, but because she's only got limited figures that come from about three parishes in Germany, or three provinces, she just multiplies them up. If we've got this in these three areas, then we think the population of Europe is de deux. Therefore, this happened at the same rate at the same time all across Europe. Therefore, we multiply and we get nine million. Doing that at the time of the suffragette movement and all those kinds of things, she's come out of abolition. She's doing this original research in the 1890s. You can't falter. You know, sometimes we sit academics love setting up straw men and more often straw women for a good kicking. 
and it's a bit like that with Jocelyn Gage. But Gerald has read her and he gets the nine million from that. If you think about when he's doing this on the Isle of Man and the impact of that little altar, if you think about what's been happening in Europe a decade before and the Shoah, you know, the Holocaust, that figure of nine million deaths and the industrial genocide of the Jewish people, I think, you know, you can imagine being a Manx, to, you know, a Manx person seeing that or a tourist from, from around about the British archi archipelago and it has an immediate resonance. And this is Gerald's centerpiece of the whole museum using that one Manx woman as being emblematic of something else. He does other things with the story as well. He makes, and I, I'd love to think this still existed in America, he was a great model maker. He made some amazing models that still exist in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and he made these little box dioramas, okay, which were very fashionable in those days. And he made one of the burning of her, Margaret and her son, John Cubbon, in the square at Castletown. And I did an interview with a dear friend of mine who described his first, because he went on and got into witchcraft and was in uh, Monique's coven. Um, and as a boy, he was describing having this moment where he was mesmerized by this diorama and this story. And he talks about feeling as if he was being drawn in to the whole model, the whole frame of the thing feeling like he was tumbling down a well and he could smell the burning and hear the sounds of the crowd in the square. And when he came to and out of his reverie, Gerald was by his side, quietly. Gerald could move silently. One of his tricks was that he used to, st he could apparently stand completely stock still in the museum and people would think he was a waxwork and particularly for nervous elderly women, he used to delight in suddenly coming to and, and you know, getting the horror. Um, he did the same actually, Culture Vanin have got a lovely thing on their website with some removal men talking and he did that in their study. If you hear their little interview when they're moving some of his stuff from his home up into the museum because he was obviously he had his magical group doing stuff there at the time. Um, he did that as well, it was one of his tricks. But the, to go back to the story in the lad, it shows, certainly in the context of that little interview I did, his enormous empathy. And the guy I was talking to said it was the first time an adult had ever talked to him like he was an adult himself. Yeah. Um, so he had that, I think he had that affinity, he had that thing with young people. He does another thing, and this I think is Gerald at his best, He's very good at subverting things. So in Castletown today, of course, you've got the little painted plaque to the burning of the witches. Gerald had the original stuck up there. Angus made it for him in his workshop in the mill, and he basically stuck it up there without telling anybody. Now, if you think you've got that thing, which was supposed to be like Nelson's column if the money hadn't run out, the smelt column, yeah? It was supposed to be him on the top the Victorian imperial figure, right? I think most people seeing that today read the little inscription to the witches. Doesn't matter who smelt is, it's Margaret and the witches that everybody remembers. And this I think is part of Gerald's, uh, what could you say, reconfiguring of Manx history in this case. He does a lot of reconfiguring history, but he does a lot of stuff for the Manx nation as well. So he's repossessing that space and giving it a totally new, feminized, unmilitaristic meaning. It'd be great to find the original plaque. I chased the Castletown commissioners and they said, because at some point it was taken down and then a wooden one put up by Scotty and Monique Wilson who had the museum after Gerald. Um, and it's been replaced since, but I did, I did chase and badger the commissioners. Anyway, we can talk about that later. So Gerald is recasting the landscape. He's giving the Isle an alternative history. And sometimes he goes too far. So he talks about the Arbury witches, okay? And if you think about it, it's wonderfully evocative, isn't it, of place. It's like the Pendle witches, the Salem witches, comes up with the Arbury witches. The only problem is, <sighs> There were women being, because what he does is he, he goes up 
and he, he reads everything in the Manx Library in the, in the archive. So he's reading David Crane's terrific bits of primary uh, research in the Manx Museum and he's kind of taking all his notes from that. So there are cases of women at Arbury who are brought in for witchcraft, but the problem is they have nothing to do with a witch's mill. But he projects their story as the backstory to the mill. This was always a witch's dancing ground. No, it wasn't. I think if, you know, James Brown, when he was editing the, the Isle of Man Times in the 1840s, had, you know, had taken his pony and trap up the, the main road, they'd have probably noticed in a working industrial complex if a lot of people had been dancing in the nip every full moon, you know? <laughs> I would hope, anyway. So, Gerald, Gerald has this way of massaging the facts, which academics hate him for, but he wasn't... He was a man with a mission, and I think these last 13 years, and he has the, the, the mill for the last 11 years of his life, he's on a quest. He doesn't want his vision of witchcraft to burn out. He wants to propagate it. He's also, and I'm coming increasingly round to this view, the more, I th the more I think and the more I read about him, he passionately believes in reincarnation. It's something that modern Wicca has completely lost from its cosmology. But you look at Gerald and his group and the founders, and they're all really, they've all picked up on reincarnation again from the East. And Gardner's pain, and you see it in some of his letters, is that it had taken him till he was in his 50s to meet what he talks about as his people, okay? He believed he'd been a witch in a previous life. He believed this idea, you know, it's a bit Socratic really, isn't it? This idea of meeting of becoming whole through this group. And he is terrified, well, he's saddened that he's wasted all this time without finding his own people. And he finds them primarily, yes, at St. Albans at Brickett Wood, but also on the Isle of Man. Um, and he's terrified that when he dies, because he's an old man, as you've seen, he'll be reborn into an era without witches, you know? He won't find them. So he begins when he's on the aisle to initiate people on a fast track. Everybody was supposed to wait for a year and a day to be initiated to begin with. And then they had to go through the three degrees of the initiation. Gerald doesn't do that, much to the fury of his high priestesses. He rattles people through and he rattles them through because he knows it's like, you know, to mix the metaphor totally, it's like, you know, taking uh, the parable with the, with the corn and just flinging it out, that the more corn you fling, the more likely some of it is going to germinate. And it did. It really did, and in surprising ways, which I'll rattle through because we're getting a bit close to the hour. So what it does do is it implants, but not in ways Gerald ever foresaw it. I don't think he ever thought that its heartland would have been in North America, but it was. Um, Rosemary Ray Buckland come to the museum. It's the Mecca. Where are you going to find about witchcraft? At the Witchcraft Museum on the Isle of Man. You know, it does what it says on the tin. They miss Gerald, but they meet the Wilsons, Scotty and Monique, who owned it after him. Uh, Monique was Gerald's last high priestess. Mixed French, Vietnamese uh, background, incredibly glamorous, incredibly troubled. Scotty had been in the RAF during the war and had what I think you term a good war in his own terms. And then he ended up working for the gas board in Scotland with a crushing loss of status. Um, and they are not good news when they're together, let's put it that way. Um, but they initiate the Bucklands and the Bucklands take Wicca to Long Island and North America and they begin to grow the craft over there in the 60s. And they're lucky as well, because what's happening at the same time? The second wave of feminism, yeah? If you do your politics in that way, if you take ownership of your body that way, if you take ownership of your life that way, it's not too far to, away to think maybe if you're a woman with a religious impulse, you're gonna to go to a feminized religion. Yeah, why did the women at Greenham, I can remember, 
sing witch songs round the wire because that was a feminist expression. You know, it wasn't the, the old boy on the cloud, it was the goddess that Gerald and his priestesses had given him. So it takes off in America. So it's kind of, Wicca's kind of an interesting thing. It doesn't, it doesn't have much of an impact in Southern Europe where the, the cult of the virgin is stronger because you've already got a female archetype. You, know? you don't have to go to the moon goddess or Diana uh, or Hecate. Um, so Gerald has an enormous amount of success doing this and he has, he has this amazing cast of people I'm just gonna rattle through in the last few minutes with you to give some idea of the counterculture he's imbibing on man. He's got Paul Cornu, Mystic Paul, with his, his beret, uh, who was obviously French on the aisle. He's got, um, he's got Patricia Crowther, who he initiates, who fans the, the long-running Sheffield Coven a woman of the most, she'd been an actress, she'd been on the stage, she'd been a musician, had incredible beauty, had incredible poise and charisma, and still has, you know her when you've met her. You know, if there was ever an archetypal witch, and Gerald painted her, actually, one of his canvases, he has, he's, got this thing, he's got this thing called Off to the Sabbath, and it's, it's a sort of Patricia Light figure disappearing up the chimney in what I think is, is Castle Russian or his painting of the, the main room of, of Castle Russian in the old prison. And, but of course, it's a glam witch, you know? It's the sort, of, um, uh, the sort of Marilyn Monroe hair, you know? And all this kind of stuff. Gerald as well does a little advert for BAE when he's on the aisle for the airlines flying people in. One of the success of the museum is it's, it's near Ronald's Way, of course. So, you, you know, people come in, it's got good access. And Gerald's byline on it is, modern witches fly BAE. <laughs> so what you've, what you've got is you've got an airliner with all these, you know, Marilyn Monroe, Betty Page looking women wearing, let's face it, nothing, looking out the window in their witches hats. And there's an old crone pootering behind on a broom. So that was very much Gerald's idea. And in people like Patricia, he found that. So he had her, he had Ray Bone, earlier Doreen Valiente, who was a very significant figure and writer as well, and he has Monique. Monique is the heir for all kinds of reasons, and the museum becomes a road crash that we'll, we'll kind of finish on in a minute. But he also has in his other casts, he has Angus MacLeod, who's one of my favorite people. I'm very fond of Angus. And Angus has a calmness and decency and an absolute spark of creativity. And as well, his, his Labrador Ivan, like his familiar spirit. And Angus is all those things Gerald was too. He likes making things, he's good with his hands, he's creative, he's thoughtful. And when things are going wrong under the Wilsons, I would suggest it's actually Angus who anchors Manx witchcraft in decency. Everybody I've ever talked to about him, all the interviews I've ever done. In fact, it was frustrating when I started doing it. I hadn't really come across Angus MacLeod, to be fair, at all. He's in none of the books on witchcraft. But all the people on the aisle I interviewed wanting stuff on Gerald, wanted to talk about him. And for the first morning, I was sat in Peel and the coffee cup was getting cold and everybody had eaten the cakes and all the old boys were around the table and a couple of girls as well. And they didn't want to talk about Gerald, they just wanted to talk about Angus. And after going through, you know, it's a bit like the stages of grief, isn't it, towards acceptance. Uh, but half 11, I thought, actually, that's the story. Let people talk about the way things they remember it. So I think he was a remarkable man. I'm doing a book on him, actually. Um, I just think he was, he was great, but he anchored Manx witchcraft in a sense of decency at a time when it was completely going screaming off the rails. Uh, the Wilsons take over the museum, they have a couple of good years, they kind of do the right things, and then they get a bit lazy, okay? The exhibits as a feature in an American magazine um, in the, about 1970, 71, and the museum looks shocking. You know, the, the, the things that, you know when um, blue tack gets damp, and everything peels off it. Everything's like that. They do a photo shoot in his, in his ritual circle. Now, if you are a witch, 
your circle is like your St. Paul's Cathedral, right? You do not have bags of shit everywhere around it. And they can't even clear up the sandbags and the cardboard boxes and the rubbish. Well, you know, because we've all done it, haven't we? Somebody comes round or, you know, you've got the estate agent coming and you push everything under the cupboards or under the carpet and whatever. They couldn't even be bothered to clean it up for that. So it looked tired and it was unloved and they were out of love with the island and its people. In the midst of all this, um, there's an American uh, photojournalist uh, for, for National Geographic who does a story about the Isle, and they go to the museum and they do a little feature on Monique, which is quite nice actually, and they do some photos of her at the museum. They go and see her at home as well. Um, and that comes out, and off the back of it, the buyer, the director of Ripley's Believe It or Not Museum, thinks, that's a really interesting collection. Wonder if we could have that and makes the offer to Scotty and Monique. If you look at the Island Press 72-73, the museum flickers like that out of the Manx experience. It's there one day, gone the other. The Wilsons sell up, move to Spain. They're not too troubled by Franco and what was going on there at the time. They take, they take the books and run. The museum's left, there's this account Angus MacLeod cycles up there from Scarlet. He finds everything in a shocking state. The Ripley's vans have gone, and there's a lot of Gerald's papers, a lot of his drawings, a lot of his things, just blowing around the ballroom that Gerald had had built. And that's another thing, just to have a little divergence for a couple of minutes. Gerald has a great business sense as well. He puts in a sprung dance hall into the mill. He has local bands playing the sapphires, jive bands. Later on, when the Wilsons are doing things right, the young couple who manage the museum for them put on rock nights, discos. They keep the place going for the south side. You know, everything closed down. They're running kind of all night events. They've got a milk bar, they've got a jukebox. These are all things, I think, you get a lot of people who were young in the 60s who went to the dances there. You know, every night there was a dance and a dance club that you could belong to. So, but all of this has gone and the, the papers are blowing around and Angus sees Monique and says, do you mind if I take them? She says, oh, I don't care. So he does and one Halloween much later, he burns in a little ritual everything he doesn't think needs to be kept on the beach at Scarlet, but he does preserve a kernel of other material. So that in a way is the kind of sad end to the museum, but I don't think it's a sad end for the Isle. The witches have flown, they're no more, until I think I started doing these little talks for the Manx Museum about a decade ago. I'm not terribly sure that Gerald was still imprinted on the Manx consciousness, although it's nice to see um, you know, the, the, the latest things people working at the Manx Museum are doing, you know, when they're doing the little potted history of the Isle, Gerald suddenly appears, which is really great. So I think they faded fast from the memory and the imprint of the Isle. As you'll know, the Witch's Mill now is a gated housing estate. It's, it's totally different. Even the plaques that used to still point out the Witch's Mill have gone from Castle Russian. But that's not to say that it wasn't culturally important. It's not to say if we take uh, Ronald Hutton's line that Wicca is the only religion that the British archipelago has ever given to the world. Well, if that's true, then it wasn't the British archipelago, it was the Isle of Man. Because all the important stuff happened in Castletown, folks. A few other places, true. But the stuff that really mattered happened here. More important, Gerald wasn't a blow-in in some senses. He was somebody who was channeling quite important, I think, cultural and religious ideas and an undoubted sense of bohemianism and the counterculture that had been building up for about 100 years before. If you want the great account of all that, the, the run-up to it all, then there's Ronald Hutton's Triumph of the Moon, which is the must-read, that shows how all this stuff was a kind of logical progression. So Gerald is, is imbibing it 
is taking all this kind of stuff in. And I think, just to leave you on, that is the true magic of the museum. And I was thinking about this, my aunt passed on uh, earlier in the year, and I did the oration for her. And I, you know, you kind of think on your feet a little bit and you, you pick things up. And it suddenly occurred to me that, and my aunt actually had met Gerald at the museum. She didn't buy one of his books that he was signing, which I'm a bit cross about. You know, if only she bought one. What did he say? And it was on the level of, you know, past the sugar. You know, it's kind of, oh, it's, oh. Um, but anyway, there we go. But I was thinking that day that the things that matter, how we define ourselves in death, are very different to the things that our host society increasingly tells us are important about life that the things people tend to use to commemorate the lives of loved ones are things like art, music, literature. They're not bank balances. Yet these things are so often, I think, now discarded in our society. And what Gardner did was provide a new poetry and a new vision. It's there in part in the poetry of Mona Douglas, there's an essence of it in the, uh, in the folded cyclostyle sheets of the faux halu. It's there in H.L. Dorr's mystic writings, which I could come on to in the Q&A, but he's a whole different, he's another one at Gerald's gang, who was really important at the time with the, the, um, the, you know, the Manx Times. But it's folding in a language and a poetry that's embodied in every glen, on every hillside, of this isle, and if there is a true magic to be had, I think it lies there. And that's where I'm gonna leave you tonight. So there you go.